Hi, Lily. Hi, Anna. Uh, why couldn't the pirate crew play cards? I don't know, Anna. Why couldn't the pirate crew play cards? Because the captain was standing on the deck. Ah, uh, oh, I quite like that one. I found the new one. Yeah, <laughs> nice. It was a good one. I just thought about like reading you one of the ones we talked about. I was like, no, I want to read you one that you don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Keep coming. All right. I'm Lily. Hi, I'm Anna. And this is Liliana's pre-read media tick. Uh, we're a podcast where we analyze and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. And today we're going to talk about, we're going to start a series, a long, a long, long journey. Yes. So we're starting with just the first, the pilot episode of the series Black Sails. Yes. Um, just going forwards, we will be doing spoilers. Like we'll probably mainly be talking about the pilot episode, but yeah, we're gonna we stick to the episode we talk to, uh, we talk about, or the theme that we're gonna talk about. Yeah, but, yeah. but we can't guarantee that we won't talk some spoilers. Yeah, so just go watch the show. Um, it's yes. a really good show. Treat yourself; it's it's wonderful. And if you're watching the first season, you I don't quite understand mm. what this is getting to. Yeah, but believe you me, this all pays off. I didn't believe it. I was. What's the word? Like a skeptic, non-believer. <laughs> but yeah, it's really good. It's um, a show that was on between 2014 and 2017, produced by the TV studio Stars. It was a, I've forgotten that it was originally came out on YouTube. Is that the studio? I thought it was I, a channel. I think it's a oh, okay. network. Maybe so I said sorry. it wrong. I did look this up earlier so I didn't get it wrong. But I well, I'm so sorry. I didn't no, no, that. I think I did get it wrong. Um, but I, no, I think because they produce stuff, but no, maybe it's just a channel or a network. Sorry, every single time I Google something because I'm German and my phone is German or like linked mm. to the German apps, it always immediately gives me the German version and I'm always like... I keep getting that now as well. No. And I'm like, this is very unhelpful for me. It's an American <laughs> premium cable and satellite television network. Sorry, network. Okay, so, um, but yeah, Black Cells is um, a show made by stars who are a TV network. Yeah. Um, and it's set in the golden age of piracy. Um, and acts as a kind of prequel to the book Treasure Island. And I'd forgotten that actually that the first season was free on YouTube um, when it first came yes. out. I'd forgotten that. I was like, oh yeah. Oh, you sadly did not get to take advantage of that. No. <laughs> yeah, you kind of want the first season for free and then like the rest of it. You'll yes, like, you sort of do. <laughs> it's not too bad. It's actually, the first season does bear like rewatching. Like we've rewatched the first episode. I've watched it like four times now for this. <laughs> Same, podcast. I just rewatched it just because <laughs> I just wanted to sort of look at certain things. But yeah, actually it was, I still enjoy the first, even though the first episode has like two of the worst scenes in the whole show, yes. I still really enjoyed it, and it's fun rewatching. watching oh, And Lily's yeah. had to listen to me bitch about these two <laughs> scenes so many times because I forgot the worst part about both these scenes, which is kind of amazing. And so treat yourself, please, watch Black Sails, yeah, watch have Black fun. Sales. Um, we're going to move forwards presuming that you've seen the show, but... Um, yes. Yeah, on a very surface level, this show could be described as Game of Thrones with pirates, but it is so much more. Um, and also, I just wanted to say that um, there's another podcast that is just dedicated to black sales, um, and like rewatch, a rewatch podcast called Fathoms Deep. And hopefully we won't repeat too much of what they've talked about about this episode. <laughs> I've kind of vaguely, because I have listened to the first episode of Fathoms Deep, and I'm, hopefully we're not going to repeat too many of their points. But I think we've got like our own lens, so it's going to be We're fine. saying like we don't want to repeat stuff based on our like not having listened to every episode, not like we're you yeah. know, plagiarizing Yeah, anything. we try not to plagiarize. I've kind of, yeah. I've, I've listened to, I think, total of like four episodes, and that's including the one, the interview that I did with Rowan Alice, yeah. which is where we found like sales. We watch this video essay oh, yeah. um, on YouTube called Rowan Alice, and she did a video on black sales in comparison to Game of Thrones in terms of storytelling and ending and oh yeah it's really good it's a good good video um, and also kind of where we got our idea about um, pre-read text from which we'll talk a bit more about later yes um, but yeah so credits to Fathom Steve we'll link that below um, so you can go listen to that as well but yeah so we're going to start off with a, just a quick summary just to refresh that because quite a lot happens in this episode yes <laughs> and the first time we tried to record this i sort of just went through sort of like the plot lines and then it just took way too long and it was like half an hour later or something and we were like we're still not through to the end of this episode <laughs> i was like no i have to actually write down what happens okay in 1714 a crew led by captain flint attacks the ship and they steal the cargo a crew member called john silver poses as the cook who he stole an important page from Side page is from the captain's log and the actual reason Captain Flint attacked the ship. John Silver infiltrates the crew and they ship to their harbor, which is Nassau in New Providence Island, where the crew buys him a session with uh, multiple sex workers, including Max, who notices his, his attention to a leather parcel in which he hid the page he stole. 
Mr. Gates, who is uh, Captain Flynn's quartermaster, goes to Mr. Guthrie's daughter, Eleanor Guthrie, to get a loan to buy votes from. Mr. Gates then goes to talk to Mosea and convinces them to vote in favor of Flint at the election. Jack Rackham, who we sort of see Gates leave, informs Singleton of the change in votes. And his lover, Anne Bonnie and Charles Vane, kill Levi and Mosiah. Captain Flint and Billy Bones, the ships, and I'm going to say this wrong because I do it every single time. Again, sorry, English is my third language, which is not saying much, but like... <laughs> Boatswain? No. Boatswain. But it doesn't make God any sense. And honestly, the <laughs> only reason I know this is because I studied the Tempest in year eight and we had to say that word a lot and everyone said it wrong. Boatswain. 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 I need to write this down phonetically for myself because I'm never going to... Because every time I read that word, I'm like, Boatswain. Honestly, I feel like most people don't know how to pronounce the word. If you pronounce it that way, nobody would care. <laughs> no, but it's important. Uh, okay, Captain Flynn and Billy Bones, the ship's bosun. No. Yes. The ship's bosun. I mean, the Ryle are scared to be voted out as captain by the crew, uh, led by Singleton, and try to convince their trade connection, Mr. Guthrie, to help them to find a Spanish galleon filled with massive treasure. However, they are interrupted by a merchant ship captain who Billy and Flint overpower, but Mr. Guthrie gets shot in the scuffle and just sits there and looks. Yeah, he doesn't really react. He just gets shot in the shoulder and he's like, oh, and you're like, oh, you, Guthrie. I don't know, if watching that scene, you sort of, are you dead? <laughs> because he just doesn't react. I'm um, sorry. After taking I got the shot in the shoulder. Like, Anna got her um, vaccination today. My vaccination. Yeah. Yay. And it's like, you know, that... <laughs> You know, you've been having like ice packs on that shoulder all day. Like, if I got shot in the shoulder, I don't know what I'd, I'd probably react. Yes, you're right. I am judging Mr. Guthrie's reaction with zero experience of getting <laughs> shot, shot randomly. But I imagine. I... <laughs> you don't really see him. He's not like writhing in pain, but he also doesn't look shocked. He just sort of sits there and has like this huh. blank expression on his face. <laughs> just grunts a little bit and you're like, yeah. okay, fair. <laughs> So they, Billy and uh, Captain Flint, they take the wounded Mr. Guthrie back to their ship. Captain Flint is confronted. They want to oust him. Uh, he gives a speech, a really rousing speech, yeah. talking of trust and his plan to steal the Spanish treasure. And he accuses Singleton of stealing the page that was actually taken by Silver. Mm -hmm. In a very lovely scene where Silver just sort of looks into his jacket <laughs> like, like, wait, did I take it? Did Singleton take it? Yeah, like, who stole this? Wait, so I'm pretty on. sure I did. Is it still here? <laughs> but like, um, so convincing. He's like, oh, just got to double check. Flint then kills Singleton and retrieves a blank page from his body and hands it to Billy, who in turn lies to the crew about the page being the missing one. And Flint rouses the crowd to join him in their future plans. They're gonna get the Spanish treasure. They're gonna be the princes of the new world. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that phrase until I rewatched it just now. And it was yeah. like, I'm gonna not make you rich. I'm not just gonna make you strong. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna make you the princes of the new world. Can I just say, Toby Stevens, I've not had a single scene in the show where I was like, you're not selling this. And yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. And it's so like, it's, it's so emotional and passionate and stuff. And he's still, I never get sort of like, oh, come on. He's such a good actor. Yeah. Um, and so the episode ends with Max uh, contacting Jack Rackham in order to sell him the page for silver. Yes. Very nice. Well, first things first, why don't you pull up a chair in the captain's cabin for a discussion on Treasure Island black sails and pre-read texts. Um, so yeah, in this segment, we're going to talk about the concept of the pre-read text. Uh, so um, we talked about this in our first episode, which you can listen to. Um, but um, basically, this term um, was coined by Rowan Ellis, who we've talked about. Oh, sorry, I took all the... I'm sorry. <laughs> Anna just went to get some Radler that I'd opened, and I got drunk all of it. <laughs> I'm so sorry, sorry, this is your one as well. This is so hilarious too because Lily is so often so freaking polite and she's like, because I always sort of make it like that we both get one refill of the beer and I always have to make her and I'm like, no, I already had my refill, you take yours. Oh no. <laughs> so this was just hilarious. Oh, you're awful. It's just like two drops came out. I've got, do you want this? Gl I've got a glass. I'm okay, sorry. I'm okay. I've got another one in my room. It's I can. Fine, Lily, it's so funny. <laughs> Sorry, we were talking about pre-read texts. We were talking about pre-read texts. Um, okay, I'll just okay, dive into a definite, quick definition. So, basically, um, pre-read text. So, when you haven't engaged with the source material, a story, or a piece of media, um, but you have a strong sense of what it is about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material, um, that, origi like, that becomes like a pre-read text. Um, so, it's kind of, you have like this cultural consciousness of a story, or characters in a story, images or concepts, 
um, from this original story, uh, which might have very little or even nothing to do with the original source material, but instead all kind of comes from the adaptations that have been made about it afterwards, and that's how you know about it. A uh, quick example, I guess, um, again, we talked about Frankenstein and how sort of Frankenstein um, has become, like the name has become synonymous with the monster, even though um, Frankenstein is the a scientist, not the monster. And also the kind of... And that is because people yeah. tend to not have read the book, mm -hmm. but sort of, but you still, you know what Frankenstein looks like based on just, even if you've never watched a movie about Frankenstein, yeah, like, everyone you know knows, the everyone idea knows, of like a monster. Yeah, yeah, every, like the idea, and also the idea of like the kind of with the green skin and the bolts through the neck yes. doesn't come from the original text, that's sort of like a movie or pop culture adaptation of that, um, but it's kind of become, come to like symbolise this character, which is really interesting. But yeah, um, so that's kind of what a pre-read text is, it's a, like cultural conceptions about a text. But yeah, I'm probably going to talk less about Treasure Island itself as a pre-read text, just like in the, in the general terms. Because also because neither you nor I have read this book. No, <laughs> no we've not. Um, and Rowan Ellis talks a lot about it. I am planning it. on it though. Yeah. I do want to yeah, listen to the room. audiobook. I got it from you the do? Library. Yeah, I got it from the library a while ago and I've been meaning to read it. Uh, it's just sitting there on my shelf. I'll try and do that for you. <laughs> That's a general problem when you read a lot. It's just sort of like, we, these are all the books that I've yeah. still been meaning to finish and I bought this one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, um, for me, so yeah, neither of us have read the text. I did have an introduction to it in primary school, and I've heard the story like three times now. Um, but basically, they kind of played us, so we were just like in a lesson one time, and they decided to play us like, they started playing as Treasure Island, and we got through like the first chapter of the audiobook. And that was fine. It was quite slow, but it was fine. And um, we came back the next day, and the teachers had forgotten where we got to. So we just basically, so they were like, oh, we'll just start again from the beginning. So we re-listened to the first chapter of the audiobook all over again. Again, it was quite slow. It was a bit more boring this time. Third day we come back, they've forgotten again, we end up listening to the same same, same chapter of the book a third time around. So yeah, basically my idea of like Treasure Island as a text was just like, this is a really boring thing that like I never got through in primary school and don't want to go near again. Lily and I both have, like, have had so many conversations about why certain media is something that people or children specifically just do not enjoy. Mm. And then you sort of think about it and you're like, it's the way it's been freaking yes. taught. I mean, this is an extreme <laughs> example. Um, yeah, that was my introduction to the text. Did you? So you've never read the text either. And again, because I grew up in a different country, it's kind of interesting because I first thought the name Long John So was something that I've heard mm -hmm. of before, yeah. but I could have gun to my head could have not told you like what even kind of genre this story takes place in or where he comes from. If you would have told me that this is just some random like famous dude who used to actually exist, I would have been like, oh sure. Think... Oh, oh, right, sorry. I was going to well, say, I don't think he actually exists. No, he did. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going to make up history you know, here. something I don't know. <laughs> no, but yeah. it's interesting because I then thought about the term Schatzinsel in German and I was mm -hmm. like, no, this is in a thousand stories. This idea of kids finding some sort of map with an X on it yeah. and sort of, we have to find the hidden treasure. And again, it's never ever referenced, and that's why we talk about pre-read text, mm. it's never referenced as something that this is based on Treasure Island, the story sort of. Yeah. yeah. They just sort of use that trope. Yeah, I wonder whether like that trope existed pre-Treasure Island or if it kind of, or even if it did, I guess like maybe the text like massively popularized it or if, yeah. Probably, yeah. just popularized it. And it became ubiquitous with the, yeah, with the story. Yeah. The but also just the idea that I know that if I find like a piece of paper that looks like a map that has an X on it, yeah. I immediately, <laughs> not in real life, maybe. <laughs> when I, you know, when you wander around, you find a piece of paper with an X on it and you're like, yeah. mm, interesting. But if you watch a movie of someone finding a map and there's an X on it, you're like, oh, that's where the treasure is buried or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's such a symbol, like a symbolic, yes. a symbolic symbol. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I kind of, so I haven't read Treasure Island, but um, I come from Bristol, which um, has uh, quite a long history of like being a port town connected to the slave trade, um, and it has a lot of sort of Treasure Island. Sort of, it has like a quite strong relationship with Treasure Island. Um, so the author, um, something Stevenson, I can't remember his first name now, um, allegedly kind of came up with the ideas for Treasure Island in this pub in Bristol called the Land Dodger Trow. I think I may be mispronouncing that. Um, and like allegedly that's kind of where like the pub that's in the book that I haven't read um, but like allegedly the pub is based on that place also a couple of the characters from Black Sails um, come from Bristol um, so like Wood Rogers who turns up later on in like he season sucks. 3 he's he sucks, shit. fucking sucks great character though but yeah, but fucking sucks yeah, yeah. Um, and also Edward Teach who is uh, Blackbeard also came from Bristol 
Um, so yeah, I kind of had like, there's like this ship in Bristol called the Matthew, which is sort of like that you go on there and you can like, do like a sort of little pirate tour of it. Oh, that's cool. Is, yeah, it's really cool. And it's like a nice, it's kind of, it's like a reconstruction of like an old boat or an old ship that would have sailed across the Atlantic. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So yeah, I kind of like, weirdly enough, I do have kind of a connection to Treasure Island, even though I didn't really think of it in that way because I'd never read the book. Also, when we talk about periodic text, when it comes to pirates, I watched the behind the scenes stuff that was on the DVD extras. And one of the actors talked about the fact that these, I'm, I don't know mispronounce his name, Sek McGowan, who plays Vane, he said that this isn't like the kind of story where you go like, Arr! and you don't have the pirate on the shoulder. And that's, that yeah. is also such a little oh, like a staple so... of this image that we have. Yeah, you never see, yeah, you never see that kind of pirate in the show. Yeah. 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 Isn't it, isn't it cool? <laughs> You just assume so much eyeliner usually, and I feel like the only person who wears so much yeah. eyeliner in the show is Max. Yeah, Max was that. Uh, maybe some of the other characters do. I'm not sure. I'd want to go back and check <laughs> if anyone else wears eyeliner. Yeah. Oh, I, should, I wouldn't have been upset if they'd worn more eyeliner on that show. Yeah. Like, I love the long hair, the flowy like shirts and stuff. The really costume of it all was really nice. We yeah. couldn't talk about gender performance, but eyeliner is just one of those things that I've just never seen someone in eyeliner looking worse. Yeah. I just kind of love the fact that like eyeliner <laughs> makes everybody just, I don't know, it just makes your eyes pop more. Mm. And I've just never been mad at anybody wearing yeah, eyeliner. It's never so just been like, yeah. you look so good. It's never been a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> After a long journey by sea, it's time to go do business in the tavern. But we'll be discussing our initial thoughts. And right now we're going to talk about the character introduction since this is the pilot. Yes. Where do we begin? Um, so I watched the deadline intro for this when they tried to sell the show and get like a bigger audience for it before it sort of aired, I think. And the idea was that it was meant to change your idea of pirates forever. And it was supposed to give you like a new perspective on our historical understanding of pirates. Because again, talking about our pre-read context of pirates in general, just in real life, they're either in the past really violent, or if they're on the news, it's sort of like attacking our way of capitalist trade, mm, right? Yeah. But we never think of them. We never really give them a fair shake in terms of just looking at sort of how this came to be in the first mm. place. Yeah. Or it's like um, child's pirate. Oh yeah, very true. Like, or like yeah, pirate uh, like parrot on the shoulder. But it's a really of... violent story it's to sort of weird. be like, you know what? Maybe we should sell this costume to to children. But then you know, you also sell children like policemen's costumes and like the are like children love war and armies and that kind of stuff so that's also yeah but we don't pistols. acknowledge the police are violent that's, when you sell that's them. true it's more like no you're gonna be a good guy yeah it's <laughs> gonna be the good guy yeah whereas like pirate is like the villain but like the fun comedy villain yeah yeah they talked about mm. how they use like, so many international fabrics for the show to sort of show the diversity of the crew Ooh, because they yeah. would have come from like different harbors in different parts of the world oh, so and obviously these people don't like necessarily ch um, change their clothing all that yeah. much <laughs> And also how they took months to build at least two boats for the show. Yeah. And they are beautiful. They're so good. Yeah. And again, it's something that I think sometimes like, certain aspects of filmmaking, you can tell that it's really good, but not noticing it. I'd never once thought about mm. those buildings or the boats looking no. fake. They yeah, just no. look so good. It's gorgeous. Do you know whether they were actually kind of like ship fairing boats or if they just filmed in like a studio? I think one of them was. Ooh. Yeah. God. Again, then you just need to give you like the behind the scenes stuff. So we started not with a character, but with, or maybe a character, with Ooh. the sea. Yes, the sea. Oh yeah, is the sea a character in this show? Let us know. Oh, I love, I love it when people like the sea is the character. Or like, uh, it's usually oh. like New York or something. It's yeah. like, actually kind of New York. It's like an additional it's, character. It's the main the show. Who's the main character? It's like actually New York's the main character. And you're like, oh my God, so deep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, but I actually, yeah, I wanted to talk about this in relation to what you just said about the idea of change our understanding of pirates forever. Yes. Okay. And I basically was thinking about this underwater shot. So there's, at the beginning of every season, there's always an underwater shot. They open like every single episode or in, at some point in every single episode, they'll have yeah. an underwater shot. And I was like, oh, why is this? Is it like, you know, just like, oh, you know, setting like the scene? Is it about like kind of the idea of like stuff being hidden? I think it kind of is. Uh, but I just kind of had the thought that, like, the first, like, thing that you see underneath the water is a shark. Yes. And so, okay, sh like, what is a shark? A shark is dangerous. A shark is, um, you know, to be feared. A shark is a monster. And that's kind of, like, the stories that we're told about sharks. It's, yeah. <laughs> this is a bit ta ta tenuous. I don't know. But, like, no. we're told that sharks are, I like, monsters. That's important. I mean, they did make and, their choice, so it must be kind of being something. Yeah. And, like, shark, you know, a shark is, like, kind of dangerous, monstrous, to be feared. Um, but, like, as... 
Uh, well, that's kind of like, you know, what we're told about sharks, but like sharks aren't actually like that dangerous to humans. Yeah. Like they're actually like, this is just like a thing that's constructed about sharks, but like they're, um... Also like they're not coming on land and biting us to death, no. like we're in the water. Yeah. <laughs> but then that's also the thing, it's sort of like they're there, they're there though, they're under the water. Yes, like, and you they, cannot see them. You cannot always. see them. And, and I think that's also kind of important, and I want to come back to this, but the idea of like, stuff being underneath the water that you can't see and so you can construct what you want to about that Ooh, because you point. can't see it and because like there's that kind of mystery and fear about it and i don't think this is like an, a direct comparison to the pirates because like no they are kind of dangerous they do kill quite a lot of people yeah. more people than the sharks do i think but <laughs> still that idea of like this is things being constructed as a monster and um because you can't like stories are being told about it because you can't really see it because it's mysterious i thought that was interesting yes that's very interesting Thank you. Yeah. And this is ultimately the idea of um, pirates is ultimately also about like the propaganda of like what we are being sold mm -hmm. in this world of who the real danger is. Yeah. And like, wh why are we being told that narrative? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so like the first kind of main, main character we get introduced to is Flint. I think it's interesting because you kind of like... The first kind of shot you get of his face, like it's like covered, he's got like material over his face. You only see his eyes. You only see his eyes and then he takes it off, but even when he, he takes it off, like you still kind of have like that kind of most of his face is obscured, it's kind of partly in shadow. It's like, oh, mysterious. We don't know something about this character. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and we immediately are introduced to him as being in charge because he's the person who sort of stops the mm -hmm. violence that is happening on deck and sort of goes like, this is enough. But he sort of stops the crew from committing more violence because they're sort of done with their job. Mm. Should we talk about, I think Vane, Jack and Anne are kind of, those are the kind of um, introductions that kind of struck me the most, I think, just because yeah. like, I wasn't really paying attention to them the first time around. And they are quite funny when you like, or parts <laughs> of the, like parts of their introductions are quite funny. Cause like the first time you see Jack, um, like you said, he's, you know, scheming and he's like, I mean, his, his first like introduction shot is just like him kind of making it like a funny face. Like it's just, yeah. he has like a double take or something. And like, that's, I was just like, oh, this is great. <laughs> Just look, looking really shifty, he does like this eye thing. Um, but like you kind of see him being the kind of schemer, and then um, when they have the confrontation with Messiah, 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 yeah, like Anne like appears from behind Jack, and she's like introduced as like the muscle behind the brains, I think. And then you also have like Vane introduced later, and he just like appears. It's like smoking out of the dark, I'm out of the dark, smoking a cigarette, and you're like, wow, this is the cool captain, like this is yeah. the cool kid. And they instantly know his name as well. It's like yes. Charles Vane, which is ironic yes. because um, we like to misname this guy. <laughs> you don't, I don't think. But I, I don't know why, but I keep calling him Vance for some reason. <laughs> it's like, oh, the most infamous, like, <laughs> the most infamous <laughs> character. He said one name before he died. And it's like Charles Vance. But I think we also want to talk about the kind of introduction. So when, when Anne is introduced, like she's kind of introduced as this sort of like badass female character but like the way they do that is they have her like kill one of the only black characters on the show or like one of the named black characters on the show or two of them in the pilot in the pilot episode yeah so like this show does get better with like its representation like in the later seasons it has like a lot of kind of black characters who like have their own storylines and like it doesn't like run into a white savior narrative um and, and they don't just exist to sort of push the narrative of the yeah. white characters they exist on their own they talk Sorry, this sounds so basic, like, well done. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't just talk to white people either. <laughs> but they, yeah. you know, they have storylines of their own. They have a backstory. They have history. They have family. Yeah, it gets, it's a lot better. Like, in kind of when you get to season three, it does it better, but it takes like two seasons to get there. And like, yeah. this first episode does not do it very well. No. Um, so yeah, like, and it's also kind of like, you know, you have like this white character being introduced as a badass character by like killing off one of the only black characters that has like much of a role. And yeah, so it's sort of like, it's that disposability of like the black characters and just kind of like for the benefit of the white character, like the white female character as well being like, look at me, like killing a man. It's like, mm, yeah, which man though? It's very sort of yeah. girl bossy the way that it's being sold to you. Sort of like, look, I'm strong. Yeah. I can kill a dude. Oh, um, overall, we should say like, also there are a lot of um, people of color who are sort of in the background. And mm. I do think that overall, this is like a huge weakness of the show for me yeah. anyways, is that you constantly see these pirate crews historically just were very diverse mm, right yeah and you just see so many people in the background but yeah. they just oftentimes just never get to speak yeah yeah and they die or like they yeah all yeah, their names so there's like the character joshua who's like a black member of the crew who kind of like it does exist on the crew for quite a long time up to like season two but he is eventually killed and he doesn't 
ever yeah he never gets to be like a proper character and you get like a lot because there, there are like characters on, on the ship that you know in the wars you've got like billy you've got silver you've got flint you've got gates like there are a lot of characters um dufresne as well who get to like have you know a role but like all of them are white so yeah it kind they of get to have arcs and they get to be part of the what drives the narrative yeah, forward gets... and what drives the action yeah and the first person you see is a black man um with these like fake teeth yeah. bearing yeah bearing it's also an interesting teeth. idea of like masculinity because you immediately know that this kind of violence that he portrays is a performance because it's fake teeth yeah that he yeah. puts on in the show in order to sort of not the actor i mean like the character yeah in the show puts on to be scary and you see him removing them afterwards and then yeah. he's just sort of like a guy who's just like you know yeah just chilling out <laughs> and like having a joke but again um, he doesn't get to do that much like yeah one of the things like when you watch the show again you sort of like this is the first sort of pirate that we see really yeah he's used as like this image of like the scariness of piracy and then doesn't get to do anything which yeah. is like very kind of tokenistic like we'll use your very face so, yes. but we're not gonna like let you have like an arc or be a character yeah yeah just such a missed opportunity as well mm. this would have been really interesting to sort of go more into the depth of this yeah. sort of dynamic on the crew also with Messiah and Levi mm. you could have just done so much more with these characters if you wouldn't just killed just them off immediately them. yeah because you do get like uh, Max and Mr. Scott but and Max does have like quite a lot to do Scott has less to do but yeah it's sort of like first couple of seasons don't do terribly like yeah they don't write terribly good black characters on the whole or like don't include that many it's also just this repetition of never allowing women who are dark skinned to do anything, which mm. you don't see for a lot of seasons until Maddie shows up. Who's yeah. Like the greatest character. She's a great character. Yeah, yeah. she's really, really well written. She's, and the actress is phenomenal. She's and, good. Oh. Yeah. and her mother as well is really oh, yeah. interesting. But we're talking about the pilot. Yes. We'll, hopefully, we'll talk about them in a later episode. But we're just trying to dip our toe in and talk about a few different things. Now it's time to splice the main brace and hoist the sails and begin our journey into open waters where society's normal rules do not apply, where dangers lurk below the surface and where genders aren't always as they seem. This episode is really interesting, again, with setting up all of the characters and kind of different sort of femininities and masculinities that are on display and kind of how those relate to power, which I really want to dig into. I think it's really cool. Because like, if you think about pirates and piracy, like your idea is like kind of like oh it's like all kind of very violent and kind of all to do with sort of like physical strength but i think violence does have like a role within this world however it's and it's like a tool but it's not a tool that's fit for all trades i, I was thinking of this metaphor that like uh, violence is like a hammer which can be very good for just like nailing something into place but not very good if you want to like you know sneak in if you want to like sneak into a house without anyone noticing you using a hammer to like break down the door isn't going to be very useful you want to like use your little tool pick but yeah there's like violence as like the masculine tool and then there's like storytelling and wit which is kind of more feminized but but kind of plays a bigger role in the story and so um i wanted to sort of give a little bit of background information so they did talk about in the extras about their training beforehand Ooh, okay. and luke arnold the actor talked about how um, he plays silver right yes. yeah they talked about sort of their training and toby stevens talked about how the show wanted to make them look like mm -hmm. they are people who pull ropes a lot and like Ooh. all the physical parts that are important parts of being on a ship. But as Mr. Gates, for example, shows that the idea of strength being associated only with one type of body is yeah. just a very simplistic oh, one. That's so interesting. Yeah. Because this is a background information, I'm a fat person. The idea of strength being associated with only very sort of chiseled bodies is a very simplistic one. Mm. It's also just not true. If you like come from like farming or something, you know there's like people of all sizes have a lot of strength or a little strength. You cannot really tell that much. Mm -hmm. Muscle mass only to a degree will tell you yeah. what kind of strength people have. And also if it's underneath fat, you really just don't know how, like, how strong someone is really. Because when I'm talking about someone's body, I'm not saying that in a judgmental way to judge their attractiveness because those things are completely objective. <laughs> Um, sorry, that's no, not objective. Subjective, subjective, yeah, the other one. <laughs> yes, no, they are completely objective. I 100% agree. Yeah. The idea of, the, you know, what's attractive to you, or even if you have attraction to any of these things, is your own business. So when I'm talking about this, I'm not, like, judging any of this. And I'm also not judging the actress, because we expect men in these shows to sort of bulk up really yeah. heavily. And also the only way these type of muscles show sometimes is if you're really dehydrated. Ooh, yeah. Oh god. Yeah, like Zac Efron. Yes, he's talked about this. Like the fact that he now in his thirties just doesn't look that way anymore because yeah. it's just very hard to sort of keep up that kind of a body. And you're like, 
well, we shouldn't have, no, no one should have ever demanded this from you no. in the first place. To expect men to all get their own body to that state, is what I'm saying, is unhealthy. Yeah. Because it's just not okay. Yeah. So again, I just wanted to give that and as a background. to expect everyone to be able to have that body as well. Yeah. Like it might be fine for some people, but other people that's just completely unsustainable, or you just don't want it anyway. I also yeah. think it's interesting because most of the men in the show do have that specific type of body, mm-hmm. right? The leading men, Vane, John Silver for certain, Billy Bones as well. Yeah, definitely Billy Bones. And I think that that sort of also shows you like the showrunner's intent mm. for like what they assume maybe like also me female viewers want. Yeah. Like we talked about this and we're going to talk about this now maybe more with like character to character. Mm-hmm. What that says about sort of um, masculinity and also about the male gaze, the female gaze. Type yeah. of thing. Do you want to jump straight in with Silver because I feel like that relates yeah, really maybe. nicely to what we've talked about him about before. Yeah. So we meet him below deck, he is clothed, <laughs> has the whitest teeth you've ever seen. Yeah, and it's like instantly, we should talk about this in character introductions actually, but like instantly so you're like, no, no, it's fine, but like instantly you're like, I do not trust this character, like why are his teeth so white? This is 1714 <laughs> bearing in mind, like nobody's teeth are, I mean like... My teeth aren't that white now. No, it's like very unlike, like they're kind of like quite like, okay, you've had some work done there probably. 1714, like I, I do not trust, like, instantly you're like, this is an untrustworthy <laughs> character, but... Yeah, it's like Silver's body, we've talked about this, actually, do you want to... So the way that we are being introduced to him, and sort of... So when Silver gets introduced to the crew, they grab him and they drag him to this building, telling him he needs to meet Blackbeard. It's one of the worst uh, scenes of It doesn't make show. sense on so many levels. They talk about this in Fathom's Deep, and like, I didn't think about it first, and when they talk about Fathom's Deep, I was like... Yes, this is why. They don't have money. They have no money. And if they take on five new crew members, like, what, like, how would they... And they talk about how they cannot afford those five new crew members. Yeah. But then they have money for, like... Also, like, Silver's... Four or five sex workers? Yeah. We, we established that Silver's quite an intelligent guy as well. If you take him to, like, um, a brothel... I mean, even if you're like, oh, maybe I'm meeting Blackbeard in the brothel, it's sort of like, he, he clock on, like, you know, he's quite... We've established he's quite an intelligent character. Yeah. Like, it would, this would not, this would not work. Like, this makes no sense. So the way that I think that Silver's being introduced is sort of like this pretty boy, so when they grab him and drag him to the brothel, they they then undress him, sort of, it's not, not consensual that scene, but I do think it sort of plays into this trope of like, mm. this is a good guy and this is just like, he wouldn't like do this himself, yeah. but he's just like being one of the it's boys. It's fine because it's like, he's not paying for himself, other people yeah. paid for him, he's being a good sport. Yes. Yeah. And he's very like sexualized in the scene, in a way that he isn't for like the rest of the show up until like the very, it's like, very interesting, in yeah. like season four, there's another scene where he, like, you see like quite a lot of his body and it's just like a bit of a shock because for the whole of the show, like you don't, apart from this scene basically, Basically, in like this episode, you don't really get Silver as a sexualized character. They kind of like he's uh, not really shirtless. No, I'm like not that I remember. Yeah, no, I think like Billy is shirtless quite a lot of the show. Yeah, but like yeah, they don't do that with Silver. I think also because like his kind of masculinity is more of a sort of like you know he's quite cowardly. He's quite like he's very quick witted. He's got kind of like more of a like opportunistic, sort of very opportunistic. He's like not the kind of like I'm gonna go and like fight a big fight and be really violent. He, he like runs away. He's very strong though, because like when you first introduced <laughs> to him, it's to him just like knocking the cook out. He's like bursting yeah. through this door, sends the cook flying. So you're like, you are quite strong. Yeah. We've seen your body, but you choose not to do that. You choose to use your wits, which is interesting because that's kind of more of a feminized kind of power. Yes, it is. Yeah. And, it's and I think it's also usually sort of framed as a negative when it's in mm. a female. I think that's also very interesting. That is interesting. Yes. Because Silver, you don't really get introduced to him as like a bad character it's sort of like oh no this is like a guy with brains mm. um, so i think the way that he was being introduced is sort of that it's pretty boy for an assumed cis female viewer for me yeah. comparing mm. especially comparing him to the other or, male characters or it's again like kind of male gaze and it's sort of like well, kind of that, projecting yeah. yourself wanting that sort of body and wanting that sort of scenario and it's sort of more of a kind of like male fantasy kind of thing it's very much sort of what men will tell you women, straight women, are into, yeah. or women who are interested in men are into. And you're like, are we though? <laughs> hmm. It's just like what you want your body to look like to sort of show a certain type of sort of muscly for other men rather than... And you're telling me this is some sort of like heterosexual like part of the game. Yeah. I don't know that it is actually. I'm not convinced. <laughs> I'm not convinced. So I wanted to talk about that indifference to, for example, Singleton. I, th- I just want to say, like, Jack Rackham yes. is also, like, a similar kind of, like, he's sort of, like, this kind of dandyish character, like, he's sort of not very strong, um, but he is very quick-witted as well, he really uses his wits 
it's interesting because he is kind of like a foil to Anne because it's like Anne is this like she is the muscle behind the brains like she's the more we'll talk about Anne a bit more in a bit but like the more intimidating like kind of in terms of like physical violence sort of character whereas Jack is again working with his wits and is the more feminized character which I think is or feminized character I don't know but like his power comes from his like feminine I think Danny's yeah. a good way of putting it like historically appropriate way for men to sort of not just be sort of muscly and strength mm. yeah and also he was the son of a tailor so it just kind of makes sense Ooh, that kind point. of like interesting clothing and stuff because you do think you said that he's like the most stereotypically kind of piratey looking one like his his to clothing yeah, his clothing looks the most sort of like like a costume in a way yeah. especially the sideburns <laughs> <laughs> so if we talk about for example Vane the way he's introduced to us is sort of the villain the bad boy we see him with muscles he has very tan skin, like a low raspy voice. He's very violent in this episode, mm. so it's very sort of stereotypical male. Yeah. Eleanor um, tries to challenge him and punches him, and then he just punches back. And then immediately also is shown to have like emotional attachment to Eleanor because he like touches her face and he's like, "Why are you gonna tell me what's going on here? Mm. Like, why did you do this? You just don't see a lot of violence towards Eleanor, really. I think maybe that's yeah, why I was that's surprised true. by this. Yeah. Because she is kind of the untouchable character, which we will talk about a bit more in a bit. He's the more kind of like traditionally kind of masculine kind of character or kind of pirate. Like kind of his power comes from his violence. And which you also kind of see in Singleton as well, who is the guy who's challenging Flint for the captaincy of the wars. And he's got like, you described it here as basic masculinity, which I like that <laughs> phrase. First with his like yeah. look, but also he has, it's either blood or scars and you could... Because of the dirt, you cannot tell the difference in the pilot. Mm. Yeah. I just meant that as like a very simplistic understanding mm. of masculinity. And I think it's a little bit cheaply sold to us. Mm, yeah. That he's sort of the bad guy because yeah, you do he's not very... root for him. Yeah, And then when you think about him and like his choices and you sort of afterwards think, wait, he just wanted to oust him democratically, which yeah. is his freaking right. Yes. And I mean <laughs> like... <whole> point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... And he actually seems to, in some degree, actually care about the crew as well, whereas, like, Flint does not give a shit about them. Like, he, like, has no respect for them at all. And, again, Flint is an interesting kind of parallel with um, Singleton and with the other male characters, like, his sort of masculinity. Um, because he is, like, you're kind of, when he's introduced to us, like you said, you know, he stops the violence and he's sort of... Um, he's kind of wearing that really kind of white shirt and you kind of made the comment that like nobody else in this show has like a shirt that white like i don't think you ever see that again perhaps like especially <laughs> not in the pirates but he's got like you know very manicured hair or like manicured i know it's kind of like nice hair everyone else's is like a bit more disgusting slick back yeah slick back and he's got like a nice kind of closely cropped beard and he's like looking kind of like everyone else is kind of quite dirty and he's like doesn't look quite the same as them and so and again i didn't notice this the first time i watched this but there's a scene where he talks to the captain of the ship that they just entered mm -hmm. and you just see his collar and you just realize how freaking bleached that thing looks <laughs> and just in terms of like the amount of sweat you would have yeah. just being on a ship it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense yeah but it does then when you see him sort of next to singleton and stuff it does make sense that he's sort of contrasting this mm. person and it comes up later with a violent act that we're going to talk about more in detail a violent scene you know he takes a step back from the violence like direct violence he's more kind of like manipulated from the sidelines and like flint as we come to learn is sort of very invested in storytelling and like that's his kind of mode of kind of power like that's his main mode of power um which again is sort of like different to that sort of like idea of like violence as power and that kind of masculine violence as power however he does use that violence again like as a tool he's like no this does actually come in handy sometimes Flint is shown to us as the sort of midway, I think, between like Singleton and Guthrie, mm. in which we don't know at this point that he comes from like a more pristine, clean, yeah. civilized, quote unquote, civilized world. When we talk about civilized, we talk about the empire, and we're not talking about it in any kind of like yeah. we agree with this. Is in the show they talk a lot about civilization is coming. So when I talk about civilized, I mean the powers that inflicted colonization on people. I don't mean that in a positive sense. But he seems to be sort of, Flint is um, shown to us as sort of a character in between those two mm, worlds. Yes. Also by the way that he dresses, maybe, mm -hmm. that he's sort of not shown as dirty as Singleton, but he's, or Vane, but he's also not as sort of clean and sort of with a wig and sort of pristine clothing as yeah. Mr. Guthrie. 
But because you just talked about Jack, it's sort of similar with him as well, mm. for a little bit, because he also doesn't come from the pirate world. Yeah. Maybe they're sort of trying to do that with both of these yeah. characters here. But that is the interesting thing about like the pirate, like the pirate world is like you get a real mix of like people coming from very different backgrounds, like kind of ex-enslaved people. And you have like people coming from like a military, like or navy background, like Flint, and then like people who were like sailors on other boats, and then like Billy, whose parents were abolitionists, I think, or or reformists or something along those lines. Yeah, you kind of get like very different, like no none of the pirates are the same, and like all of the masculinities are very different, which is very interesting. So we're in the scene that I mentioned in the breakdown of the plot, when Flint and Singleton fight, when they take the wounded Mr. Guthrie back to the ship. Flint challenges Singleton to a fight, mm -hmm. and they fight. Yes. And they really fight. They really fucking fight, yeah. And from the beginning, there's a huge contrast from the beginning of the episode where he says, it's enough, when Flint is the one who stops yeah. any kind of brutality, yeah. we in the end go to a very, very, very violent and very, very physical fight. And you see Flint, and in the end, sort of winning because he slams Sorry, you made the joke the other day about a loose cannon. <laughs> he slams a cannonball into his head. Yeah. And there's just like, and then you get that amazing shot of him like looking up, just like with those like massive eyes and like yeah. the blood all down his face and on his, that white shirt is, it's not very white anymore. No. Also but his like, face is just, it's oh, so animalistic, yeah. almost like a, like a wolf that's just like bit into, you yeah. know, it's, it's prey or something. But it like completely kind of wipes out that image of him as just like the backseat character who yes. just like kind of works in the sidelines and like, you're like, no, this character is like full of rage and like, also, it's almost like too much. It's like the crew just goes yes. quiet and they're like, I don't quite know what to make of this. Like, this is almost, you're almost going too far. And I don't know whether, because um, Flint is like very, kind of controls what people see about him. And so like, you don't know kind of quite whether this is like the true rage coming through, or whether it's just a performance or like a bit of the two. Like, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it's- That's a good yeah. point. I never yeah. thought about it that way. Because also this comes right after Flint talks to Billy about when he says he wants to be the king mm -hmm. of this very democratic world as opposed to England. Yeah, although we do see that democracy being instantly undermined by all the corruption yes, and stuff. <laughs> but yes, but yeah. Um, yeah. Which they would never do in England. Oh no. <laughs> in terms of masculinity, also wanted to talk about the, uh, the queerness a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of gender and stuff. Because when they go to see Mr. Guthrie, the person who interrupts that conversation with them trying to sort of get help from Mr. Guthrie to find the Spanish uh, treasure is uh, Captain Hume uh, from a boat that they thought was in Boston which is called the Scarborough mm -hmm. and the captain comes in and then challenges Mr. Guthrie and sort of talks to him about you know there's been this gossip around town that mm. you use sort of trade that you get through pirates and sell it and that's how you make money and he makes and again, when you watch this for the first time, you don't think that this is going to be like that deep yeah. of a cut or something. Yeah. But this, when you sort of seen the show, you're like, oh my god, they like, that's what I'm saying about like, when you watch it for the first time, you might be sort of disappointed. This all is, like, they're all planting stuff that they're going to pick mm -hmm. up later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he says this thing, he says, and he says, gossip is what holds civilization together and because it reinforces shame. And without shame, the world is a very dangerous place. And I thought this was interesting because gossip usually is framed as such a female thing. Yes. And it isn't in this show. I mean, it's to do with Flint. It's to do with yeah. his queerness. It's to do with civilization, sort of power, very masculine. Yeah. Well, is it masculine? masculine? I don't know, because it's like, it's still like gossip is still like a sort of like feminized thing, but it's used in this sort of very powerful way. Like you see the kind of like power of that. I don't know. I don't know whether. Just because they yeah. talk about gossip, it's like a. Hume mm -hmm. talks about gossip as a positive thing. Yeah. It's yeah. a powerful tool. Yeah. And I've never heard it being talked that way. It's specific. very That's why I'm Cambodian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Discourse. But yeah. Yeah, is is gossip a masculine tool in this context, or is it kind of femininity taken to a different level, or is it neither of those things? Like, it's just one thing that I learned in my twenties, which I never thought about as a teenager, is that men gossip so much, and we never call it that. <gasps> oh, and I thought it was interesting yeah. that in this show they introduce gossip through a male member mm. yeah. of quote unquote civilization, meaning the empire, and talking about how it's like a very important thing for him, like. He talks about how we need gossip, mm. and I just yeah. thought it was very interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. And again, the first time you watch this, if you, by the way, I just want to say that this is very important. If you get overwhelmed by all of these characters the first time you watch this, and you're like, I don't remember who is what and what are they doing, 
That's perfectly fine. Yeah, no, we didn't know. I didn't know who Jack and Anne were until like halfway through season two. <laughs> I had no idea who these characters were. <laughs> um, should we just talk very quickly about femininity in the show? I think it's really interesting that yes. um, it's not kind of maybe amazingly well done in the first episode, but you do get a real range of female characters and they like all have like whole power, but in very different ways. Um, so we talked about Anne having power through like her like physical like violence and um, sort of getting to the point. Like she kind of talks very bluntly um, and she can fight really well. They're all kind of not like the other girls, <laughs> you know. They're just they are actually quite well kind of uh, like conceptualized, I think. Because you also have Max, who I think is the most sort of like traditionally feminine of the characters. Yeah. But she's also like her femininity is so stro- like, strong. But it's also like, a job. Yeah. Like. You were introduced to her as a sex worker, mm. so the ve- so the way that she portrays her own femininity Very in this true. moment, you don't necessarily know how much of that is, for one, performance that is learned through the process of just growing up, you know, being sort of female connotated, also how much she's putting this on just because she's working. Yeah, I think yeah, it's interest- it is yeah important to remember like that in this, it's important that she is like a sex worker and that she is like a black woman and that kind of informs her femininity, obviously. In fact, I'm Steve in the podcast that we referenced earlier. Mm-hmm. They talk about the idea of Max's clothing changing and sort of becoming more structured later. Mm-hmm. And they refer to this as armor, which I thought was really interesting. Yes, especially as her clothing is so feminine, which I think sums up her character really nicely because she's like a very feminine character in many ways. Like she kind of deals with like, again, gossip and with like using her wits and like relationships and connections with people like she hit like later on when she's like sort of running Nassau she's she relies completely on gossip to run Nassau and that like using sort of femininity to her advantage is what she does throughout the show but it's not portrayed as like this sort of like silly weakness it's like no this is really strong like what you were saying about gossip being like the tool of the empire this thing is really really strong in this show it's like it's key to the like how everything's running and like how power like works in this world She's not the little, which I think is yes. really good, because yeah. we usually sort of see sex workers as sort of more demure type of sad characters, mm. and you're like, no, this is a person who knows what she's doing, and she's using it to her advantage. Yeah. Which goes from, which I think is also important, from like survival yes. to yeah. like making more strategic moves for mm. her own future, which mm-hmm. as a black character, she just doesn't have the same privilege as, for example, Eleanor does. Mm. Oh, to completely. sort of have more power to begin with that she can sort of plan a future in the first place. She's also presented with having sort of this French accent, which I thought was really interesting mm. because it's also sort of connected to this very sort of stereotypical understanding of sexiness and stuff, mm. but it's also a very important sort of connection to colonization yeah. and... French colonization specifically, which I don't think they talk a lot about on the no, show. No, it's mainly Spanish and English colonization, yeah. yeah. I just thought it was interesting because you sort of are introduced to this, which maybe they did this really smartly and I just didn't notice, but maybe they sort of introduced this, oh, she has like a French accent, it's very yeah. sexy, and then you learn about her backstory mm. and you're like, oh no, this is not sexy. Yeah. This has violence and trauma and pain built in mm-hmm. because the reason she has an accent is not because of choice or because of the sort of this weird fetishization of something that has a horrible backstory, which usually is where a lot of um, fetishization type mm. of things come from, especially with women who aren't white. And I think Eleanor, again, is really interesting because it's sort of, where does her power come from? So in the pilot, we see Max sort of leave John Silver, grab Eleanor by the hand mm-hmm. and uh, walk away with her. So we know that these two women are connected and then we, in the pilot, see them having sex. And Eleanor sort of very differently depicted in terms of her clothing than Max's. Um, her clothing, I thought it was really interesting because she wore like like almost like the same um, shirts as the men almost. Yeah. I'm sure it's cut differently. I'm sure that the the stylist on the show did like a great job of like making all of that tailored. Mm-hmm. But it's sort of this like masculine, quote unquote masculine, like the men's shirt and then sort of like this vest, which was yeah. sort of like or a like, little bit more feminine. Is it, yeah. Was it a corset or a like um, a... Uh, not gile, um waistcoat. I can't quite remember what like she wears. Just something that would structure her body more feminine. You mean? Yeah, yeah. But it also kind of comes across as kind of masculine. Like she's kind of got that sort of like. So yeah. So she has that kind of like kind of masculine, feminine, feminine clothing, and she also like talks like she uses a lot of swear words and very coarse language. And you kind of get the impression that she's sort of trying to present herself as sort of like one of the guys. Yeah, so I think what she does is she bases her power a lot on like the masculinity around her. Like she kind of you get the impression that she really very much wants to be her own woman and she does whatever will like sort of allow her to do that at the time so 
in the Go Fuck Myself scene. Okay, so this is one scene which we both hated, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah. Which is really horrible, and I forgot how horrible it was. A dude challenges her and calls her a cunt, which I refuse to believe that she's never heard that before. And she, everything goes quiet, and again, I don't understand why, because I'm assuming this is the kind of language that they throw around on the daily. Mm -hmm. But she reacts to it and then talks to him about how he's an earner and that makes her pussy wet and he told her to go fuck herself and then she goes, well I guess I will go fuck myself. And it's very, god, it's sort of such written yeah. from like a bro's understanding of what like a tough girl looks like yeah. and what a tough girl sounds like and it's horrible. But I think it's interesting because her power and the way that she's sort of depicted and the way that she also sees herself mm. is still only connected to men. Yes. And connected to men and connected to wealth, education yes. and like her like kind of class like privilege. Like that's where her power, like she tries to present herself as sort of like a kind of more, I guess, like working class character or like one of the lads. She tries to like punch Vane in the face. That does not work. She tries to sort of be powerful in the way that the men are, yeah. which is why she punches Vane in the face. And then he immediately puts her back in a place of like, you're still a woman in this scenario, like this doesn't work yeah. for you. And like, this isn't where your power comes from. Because it's like, Anne could get away with doing something like that, because Anne's like, she has that background of like, you know, she grew up, she had like, you learn that she had like a very tough, like, you learn that like Anne's backstory is quite, like she had quite a difficult, like... Quite abusive and quite, Yes, thank you. She had a very like abusive background. Um, like she was married very young and so like she had to learn to kind of have this sort of like to like her um physical strength and her like fighting skills come from that background uh, whereas like Eleanor pretends to have like she does she pretends to sort of be on that same level but she doesn't have that background like her background is like wealth and power and privilege from her father and from her like family line Anne actually is like a physical danger to these men like mm. she can actually kill them and Eleanor is completely economic Yes, but she tries to kind of distance herself from that, but through this masculine behaviour in interesting ways. And, okay, I just wanted to make this one final point, which we can... I think there's a really interesting tension between vulnerability and strength in relationships, which I think we can also relate to gender. Yeah. Um, because the characters... Having relationships with people in this show can often be very dangerous for the characters because it puts them in vulnerable positions. Yeah, Max and Eleanor, power dynamics completely, like, skewed off. Max is very, very vulnerable in that situation and pays for it because Eleanor does not protect her. And so it's that kind of, and that has repercussions throughout the show, like, and she kind of cuts herself off. Anne has a similar thing with Jack where she's like, I don't want to, I want to distance myself from you because I feel like this relationship doesn't help me. Uh, I feel like this is like oppressing me. But then, and that's kind of like, I feel like this is a weakness for me and like my vulnerability here is a weakness for me. And also with Gates and Flint as well, they have that, like, Gates is very vulnerable because... Flint will, he, Flint relies on Gates, but only as a yes man, and then as soon as he says no, he gets killed. Yeah. So he, so, so like, there's that kind of, like, that vulnerability in being in a relationship where it's not equal. But at the same time, when it is equal, there's a lot of strength in that, like with Anne and Jack, when they kind of re reconcile, and with Anne and Max as well at the end, like, that's a very important part of their relationship. And with Flint and Silver, however, you see that there's, like, a lot of tension here, and it is very dangerous. Like, there's a lot of strength and not even just strength but also like happiness and I don't know just like richness that can come from these like relationships but at the same time that comes with a lot of risk especially if the other person isn't on the same page and so that kind of like feminine vulnerability is very dangerous but also can be very powerful as well. That's such a good thing because I was just sort of like yeah oh my god I never thought about it that way. <laughs> Sorry it was quite long but I just... No I think it's a really good point mm -hmm. but now that I'm thinking about like Eleanor's relation to everybody because we're talking about a relation mm -hmm. only being economic now i'm thinking like even her relationship to max is economic <gasps> it is because she pays she pays for, for the privilege. privilege of being the only person who actually gets to have quote-unquote sex with her in this show in the scenario of the show she is not apparently allowed to sleep with anybody else mm -hmm. for money she pays for the privilege of being the only one that max sleeps with yeah even that relationship is completely economical. Yeah. And she's in, she, like, her interest in Flint is also economical about sort of the power and sort of what mm -hmm. Nassau can turn into, right? The only person she doesn't have an economic relationship with from the get go is Vane. Because there was like an actual romantic connection there that wasn't based in money in the Ooh. beginning. 
It is now because the oh, no, but it was. But wasn't it because no, she. But Blackbeard. You know, yeah, yeah. But Eleanor's relationship are about money. Oh, this is good. Even with Mr. Scott, really. Yes. Yeah, because like he's still technically enslaved, and he, yeah. she's like, "Oh, I never saw you that way." It's like, well, Eleanor, well, that doesn't. A, it's not really the nice point. For yeah. You. <laughs> yeah, nice for you, Eleanor. If someone is like completely dependent on you for the livelihood, for any kind of status that they have, mm, the mm. idea of you saying to them, "Well, I never saw it that way," and you're like. Yeah, that's because you're in this hierarchy are above me. Yeah, because you don't have to, because you don't have to think about it. Yeah. Because it's not your problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right, shall we move on to the last section, I think? Sure. We've got a great view from up here in the crow's nest where we can make observations and completely remove them from their context within the show. In fact, I see something now. I think I see a... Sail? Spanish Man of War? Long John Silver? No, I see a period inappropriate six pack. <laughs> So we talked about this before for a second. Silver, his teeth are very fucking white, but then, you know, he's an actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just very, like, period inappropriate. And also, like, um, like his, um, yeah, his six pack and, like, his very built body. I mean, I haven't really researched into the, like, you were saying they did think about kind of, like, how bodies were portrayed in the show, so maybe I'm completely wrong on this. Plus, it's their argument for this. Yeah. I mean, the idea of, like, putting me very muscly men on a television show and sort of being like, no, this is because it's of the period. period. Like, you know, like, again, like, Gates must be on a ship all day long, also doing a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. even though he's the uh, charter... Quartermaster. No, is he the quarter... Yeah, quartermaster. Yeah. But I was just thinking, because I know that in, like, Stranger Things, for example, Billy in Stranger Things, um, I think I read that he wasn't allowed to, like, use um, certain, like, machines and things to sort of, like, get, like, a really, really, like, um, toned six-pack, like, a really, you know, when you can see, like, all the packs. Um, you because, mean like from a 21st century perspective? Yeah, he wasn't allowed to have like a 21st century sort of built body because... <laughs> Sorry, I'm just know. thinking about the I, difference between like a 1980s built body and like a 21st century yeah. built body. Because he is very like muscular but it's like yes. a different, like the way that like the muscle mass is on his body is like slightly different because they had different kind of machines and things. This is what I read somewhere anyway. And just like looking at Silver's body, I'm like, that's a very 21st century six pack. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It does look like someone made sure that this person like trained every single specific like muscle in like the upper body, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with strength really. You know yeah. what I mean? It's about definition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it's like you'll get muscles that you'll get get from like pulling on a rope to like hoist a sail or whatever is very different to what you'll get if you're on like a rowing machine or like you know if you're sort of. Yeah. For me, that doesn't ruin a show like this. Only something I noticed because I'd seen that thing about Stranger Things. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. But like, I really, I don't care that much about like whether like somebody's like a six pack is too defined. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I don't, I really don't care. Hey, you're right your choice always. Yeah. yeah. But it's this thing of, I think it's very interesting because this is the type of body that you as someone, they just assume that you're heterosexual. They will put this kind of body in front of you and then be mad at you for not liking it or yeah. for not praising it. And you're like, I never asked for this. <laughs> you do you if this yeah. makes you feel great, by all means. But it's sort of a very, weirdly enough, male understanding yeah. of what men, of what attractive men look like. It's a very sort of heteronormative understanding of mm -hmm. sexiness and attractiveness, and yeah, definitely. And this is also why I think you sort of see it's sort of the quality of the show progressing. You don't really have that as much sort of going down the line. Mm, yeah. And when you do see him naked later, it has sort of like an intimacy calm. Like, yeah. um, context to it later on. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about the cook? <laughs> yeah, just literally something that I noticed from like one of my um, rewatches is just that the cook's got a Scouse accent. I what think. I thought. I think. I'm not very good at Scouse. accents. I've got to say, Scouse is when you're from Liverpool, so it's a Liverpudlian accent. Ah. Yeah, which I makes Scouse if it's Liverpool. I don't know. I'm so sorry. I, I'm not from <laughs> Liverpool. Like, I've got some family from Liverpool, but I don't. I, I don't know these. I don't know the answer to these questions. But it does make sense that he'd be from Liverpool because Liverpool was another port city, um, yeah. of the period. Um, but yeah, the cook. R.I.P. the cook. But yeah, it's just the way he said like nothing. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's, he's from Liverpool. Did you have anything that you just wanted to say that was nice about this episode? Or So in terms of being a queer person, what's really important to me is representation. And the greatest representation in this episode we get <laughs> is in the very beginning of the show when Captain Flint's crew storms the ship. There's a dude who hugs his legs and just screams. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yes, that would be me in this scenario. I feel seen. <laughs> Because 
I always find it so funny in those type of shows. You know when you're a kid or something, but it's always like, there's an adventure, there's danger, and you're like, yes, and why doesn't anything ever happen in this town that I live in? And then the idea of me being told like, here's a gun, here's a sword, go fight a war on a ship. I would hug my legs and start screaming. Yes, no, same. <laughs> so I feel very represented by this dude. <laughs> I love Randall's cat. I also just vaguely remember history teachers talking about the fact that they were that they often had yeah. cats on boats just because of like mice and stuff. Yeah, very practical. Yeah. yeah. And again, I don't think they do that a lot on the show. No, and I'm not enough offended. <laughs> yeah, one thing, if, if, if that sauce could have been improved in one way, it would have been, yeah, give us some more, more ship's cats, cats please. Please. <laughs> Um, I, I just wanted to point out the amazing faces that were made throughout this one episode. Like, <laughs> Gates is so funny. Like, I forget yes. how funny Gates is. And just like some of his delivery, where he'll just be like, Where's Guthrie? Like, and then looks over the side of the boat and he's like, Oh, Jesus. And then just like walks <laughs> off. And it's just, it's so good. And just like, ah. Oh. And I didn't appreciate it the first time around because I was so confused about who anyone was. And he also talks to Billy and convinces him to go with Captain Flint to Mr. Guthrie first. And he's like, you're such an important part of this crew and you're so respected and then talks to Flynn and says <laughs> Billy's gonna come with you and Flynn immediately goes who's Billy? <laughs> Which is just oh yeah that's it's such lovely a, it's lovely very lovely and just watching Billy's face as well throughout the whole thing he has some very confused expressions he just does not know what's going on yeah. And he's so conflicted because he's the moral backbone in that moment mm -hmm. and he's sort of then dragged into this propaganda with the flag piece of paper which yeah. I do want to talk about for a second sure. because I don't remember, there's not really, they do not really show a moment where Captain Flint has just randomly a piece of paper in his shirt and he grabs it from Singleton's yeah. body. So, body so, for some, so Singleton just happens, like very coincidentally happens to have like a blank piece of paper it on his person just for whatever reason that's very lucky but i guess in a way it sort of shows how contingent everything is on that moment like it could have gone so many different ways like if billy had oh, said you mean like, it sort of ups the danger yeah the stakes Ooh. are so high because it's like well there's no got to be any paper oh there is a piece of paper oh but like the paper is blank billy's going to tell them oh billy did like it relies on so many things like it relies on yeah that's the piece of paper it relies on billy lying and it yeah just ups the stakes at that moment so I didn't even think about it that way. I just think like, where did that paper come from? <laughs> Does Flint at some point in this episode put a piece of paper in his shirt because I don't remember mm. that? I guess it also shows like Flint's just absolute faith in his vision of things. He's like, no, like this person has stolen the paper. Like even though he's like, it's interesting because it's like, is he doing it just because he's like, this is how I can get the crew back by placing it on Singleton being like us versus them. Yeah. Like this guy is trying to steal our treasure from us. Or does he genuinely think it's Singleton? And he's just so he's just so so convinced that it is him, and he's so convinced of his vision that like this paper just seems to appear out of nowhere. Like he's that committed to like his vision. Also, Lily had a really good question for the sort of the narrative for the plot. She asked, "What would have happened if Flint hadn't decided to pick up the said and just been arrested yeah. by um, Captain Hume?" And I think that's a very good point because they do, in a weird way, <laughs> sort of save Guthrie. Yeah, like if they hadn't yeah. appeared, Guff three would have been arrested, which would have had a huge. He probably would have just been hanged. Oh yeah. Also, like this would have had a huge like repercussions for Eleanor. Yeah, like because the only reason she has that power is because of her father. Yeah, the show would have been very different if they had <laughs> made him that visit. Like it's and again, it's like everything's so contingent. Like everything, the stakes yeah. are so high with like every choice you make. Like I was thinking, even just like when they see um, Scarborough and they're like, oh, we need to go now. It's like, if they just dawdled a bit, like they might have got like fired on and all died. Like every voice everyone makes is so high stakes because it's like everything, you know, everything's happening and it's all like, um, yeah, like your life could be like make or break. Like everyone's fortunes are like constantly turning, like even in the last like scene. So like Flint's just set up like Prince of the New World. And then we see like Max and Jack, Max selling the page to Jack. And it's like, okay, these fortunes are turning so quickly. Like, everyone's yeah everything's moving so fast yeah. also that max and uh silver are sort of shown as these sort of opportunistic characters yes. silver has a choice to be opportunistic and talks about this like this is an addict he talks about like i'm addicted to mm. if i see a chance i just take, take it. it yeah for max this is mm. just any possibility to get out of the situation she's in now to sort of grasp any mm. kind of power she might have in the future yeah. It's a very different, um, they have very different starting off points is what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> so 
Although, I mean, Silver does want to get out as well. Like, they both want, in the first place anyway, they both want to get out of that world. And, like, I guess in a way, like, even though Silver is in a much more privileged position than Max in a sense, he's still, you know, part of this crew. Like, he has to kind of keep, um, you know, being part of this, like, violent lifestyle that he's not very, like, he's not particularly interested. He doesn't really want to be on a ship, he says, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. He also doesn't want to be a cook necessarily. He sucks at it anyway. He sucks. Yeah. I just wanted to jump back to a point about like um, Flint and how he sort of like obscures parts of himself and obscures parts of like the truth and how that's kind of how he has power by like kind of choosing how much of the story he wants to reveal. And I thought it was like a very symbolic moment in the in the first episode when he's talking to Billy about there's a war coming, Billy. We need a king. I I am your king. And like he's convincing Billy that like he needs to follow like Billy needs to follow Flint in order to like have a future of Nassau and all this is taking place and then like oh, they're on this little boat together and then like Flint makes this sort of speech then the sail drops he hits Flint drops the sail and then the ship is there oh that's a really yeah. good shot that was so beautiful it's really beautiful and it's so symbolic as well because it's like Billy gets this kind of com conversation where he's like he learns the truth but like everybody else is like completely masked out oh, of that oh, because nice. that sail is there and Flint chooses to drop it then and choose uh, chooses what he allows other people to see which I think also can relate to shame as well it's like you choose that kind of desire to have control of what other people can see about you I just see this is sort of like you immediately were like oh this is symbolic and I was like this is a really good shot it is also a really good <laughs> shot though because like from the perspective you're sitting as the audience as well you don't see the other ship you just see the sail and then yeah. the sail drops and you're like oh they're already at the ship yeah, because yeah. you don't know that you don't know how far they've come from Mr. Godfrey's house to the ship yeah. you don't know that and then you're really like oh they're already there yeah it plays with your perspective and it, it, yeah, it stops you from seeing it again it's like it controls how much of the stuff you see and you don't know exactly where you are until like Flint chooses to show you where you are. And again, if you're watching this show and if you are listening to us and you don't really care about spoilers, <laughs> if you pay attention to anything to do with propaganda, mm. who controls the narrative, mm. who believes the story, how much does that matter? Mm. And that is very important like set up again for the rest of the show. I am very critical of the quality of the writing of the first episode yeah. of the pilot, yeah. but it is unbelievably brave to plant so many different seeds in something that you would then expect an audience to pick up later. So many shows don't treat the audience like an audience that can pick up clues and can yeah. pick up cues and can sort of understand different perspectives and... It treats you with respect. As yes, it member. really respects you. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good way of putting it. It's so gorgeous. I think that's a good note to kind of bring to come to our closing, yeah. closing section. So now we come to um, our closing segment, um, Mapping Out Media where we look at treasures both found and still to be discovered. And um, this is just a very simple segment where we just give a uh, recommendation, just something that we've enjoyed this week or been enjoying for a month or whatever. That can be books, movies, whatever. My recommendation is the song Kiss Me More by Doja Cat and SZA because I love it so much yeah, and I've been song. waiting for it. I've been waiting to get sick of this song and it just has not happened. <laughs> the song is just beautiful and I love it so much and I so yes. yes, that's my recommendation for this week. Very nice. Um, my recommendation is the podcast Within the Wires, which is a Night Vale Presents um, podcast. I think it's actually like they've stopped making episodes of this now. Um, but I always seem to like, I listen to like a season like every once every two years or something. like, <laughs> And I always really enjoy them. But I don't know, it's sort of, um, it's like based on like um, found found audio, I think. So it's sort of like the first um, series is like um, a selection of like... Um, uh, meditation tapes the second is uh, these sort of um, art audio guide tours and the third season is um, somebody talking to a tape recorder to like their secretary to like make um, like write letters and like make notes for them it's so interesting it's really interesting and it's really really good and it's just great for like to listen to just before bed apart from the ones that are slightly creepy but like usually it's perfect <laughs> and you're just sort of like kind of falling asleep and it's very relaxing so i yeah highly recommend within the wires if you haven't listened to that already so our social media handles on both Instagram and Twitter are LilianaPod, um, just add LilianaPod, and Liliana is spelled L-I-L-I -L -I and then A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Yeah, it's very easy to remember, it's just two letters for each yes. of the names. So yeah. <laughs> That's both on Instagram and on Twitter, and our email if you want to contact us about episode ideas, or if you want to be a guest because you're a huge Black <gasps> yes. Sales fan. We're going to start talking about Studio Ghibli movies really mm, soon. Yeah, so... We're going to go through them, hopefully chronologically. <laughs> If you want to be a guest, if you want to make recommendations, by all means, please contact us. Our email is Liliana's pre-read media take at hotmail.com. We're going to put all of this in our show notes, also the recommendation 
How did Captain Rackham afford his Jolly Roger flag, Louis? I don't know, Anna. How did Captain Jack Rackham afford his Jolly Roger flag? He bought it on sale. <laughs> <laughs> standing ovation. I'm standing. <laughs> I love that joke.